Welcome to the Center Collaborative, Creative Solutions in Behavioral Health and Criminal Justice, brought to you by the Oregon Center on Behavioral Health and Justice Integration, which is also known as the Center. We at the Center are all about solutions. Our job in Oregon is to facilitate improvement of the system so behavioral health and criminal justice can work better together to engage people in treatment while promoting public safety. I am your host, Chris Thomas. I hold a master's degree in clinical psychology and have focused on the intersection between behavioral health and criminal justice for 20 years. Over seven of those years were behind the walls of a maximum security prison. During this podcast, you will have the opportunity to sit in on real, in-depth conversations with experts about complex topics in a way that is both fascinating and digestible. We will focus not just on what is wrong with the system, but what is going right and how we can work together to evolve. Today's episode is part two of a two-part series. We are joined once again by Ari Wagner, Chief Operating Officer for Greater Oregon Behavioral Health Incorporated, GOBI, and the Director of Operations, which is the department that the center is under. Ari and I discuss why scaring, educating, and exercising someone out of crime alone does not work. We talk about exposure to childhood trauma as a risk factor for engagement in the criminal justice system and the importance of one stable and supportive adult in a child's life as a protective factor. We talk about the center's juvenile SEM work and the importance of looking at data and asking questions around overrepresentation within the juvenile justice system so changes can be made. Finally, we talk about Ari's book, Dispatches from Juvenile Hall, Fixing a Failing System written under the name Linda Wagner. Welcome to our conversation. In general society, the knowledge around the juvenile system generally is around scared straight in boot camps, right? And because we don't talk about, and it's not common knowledge, the research and how most folks they end up in the adult system, yes, had a juvenile history, but there's a lot of people who have a juvenile history that never get there. So there is this response around scared straight and boot camps that maybe on the face folks feel like it works, but it really doesn't work. And so I'd like to spend a moment, if you want to, around talking about programs like that and how they're not very helpful. Yeah, I, I I would like to give that some time. I, I was so unpopular during this part of my career because <laughs> you know, this America and many of the places I worked have this romantic, romanticized relationship with these kinds of uh, interventions. That does make it on the news. So let's talk about scaring people out of crime, exercising them out of crime, and trying to educate them out of crime which has been uh, the popular ways of doing that and the most visible in the media. So scaring them out of crime. What does that look like? You see this bus, picks up a bunch of kids who look like they're roughnecks. You know, they're really gonna, gonna cause trouble. They're a big threat. Take them up to the penitentiary. You have a bunch of individuals who are in the prison system uh, lined up, yelling at them, cursing at them, shaming them, threatening them. And you see these hard to face young people start to soften and get scared and eventually break down and cry that they're so frightened. And the implication of that message is once, if you keep doing what you're doing, young person, you're gonna come here and it's worse than what you're hearing. You're gonna experience it. And so, and then the show ends with, with all those young people going home and all the rest of the world believing who's watching rest of the world watching, believing oh, we're safer tonight because they went and they got, they got that talking to. So here's what actually happens in the data. Crime goes up for high risk offenders exposed to that. Goes up for medium and even some low risk. And why that happens is what you just witnessed on that very popular segment of the news or episode of whatever Monday night program, news program, What you just witnessed is young people being shamed and threatened 
and uh, given a future of unpredictability and um, disrespected on, in front of everyone who's watching. Those are the same factors they're exposed to or many of them at home that caused them to act out in the first place. So the crying wasn't this, oh my gosh, I'll never do that again, even though they might say that to the camera. The crying was, this feels horrible and I wish it would stop and I can't make it stop. So I'm gonna go numb out and for the majority of them actually commit more crime. So you cannot, crime actually goes up somewhere between 25 and 40% after they leave. So there's some victim that wouldn't have been victimized except a very vulnerable individual with very poor coping skills and no other means to manage that kind of intensity of emotions was exposed to a majorly horrific trigger. That's what we did. And we all applaud. The emotionality around crime is, is something else. So no, that doesn't work. Exercising out of crime, that's the other one. That's that's the other one where it's been referred to as like a boot camp approach where you go and you work out. You're gonna work out in crime. And you hear some of, I mean not so much so often, but some people talking about, well, in my day, we would just join the military. We didn't have to go to prison. They sent us here instead. And then boot camp, I, you know, the, these stories that never were real or translated to the general population. So the exercising doesn't address the criminogenic factors, right? It doesn't, it might give someone an outlet for having some kinetic stuff going on, but it doesn't help healing of trauma. It doesn't help with a thinking error. It doesn't help with the impact of all of those other risk factors that are going on. What it does is it makes a very strong and fast criminal. That's what it does. I would imagine too that you're doubling down on the trauma too, because a lot of those boot camp programs are based on the old school drill sergeant, shaming, yelling, like we were just talking about with Scared Straight. So you're exercising and you're getting yelled at, and then there's the trauma piece of that as well. Absolutely, absolutely. And and for, there might be an ear listening to this that thinks, oh, I just wanna to be too soft on this person, doesn't wanna go. I really do support good physical activity. There's a lot of benefits of being in shape. There's a lot of good hormones that get released by exercising. It's a great thing to do with young people and helping their health and their emotional stability but you have to combine that with treatment that addresses risk. You have to combine it with corrections responses to have any impact on crime. I'm just saying without those other things, you're increasing it. If you have those other things, crime goes down somewhere between 40 and 65%, by the way, rather than going up as much as 45. What we know, as I said, from over 40 years of research that looked at what decreased and what increased. So now we're talking about the increase thing. The other increase is you can't educate people out of crime. You're going to sit in this class. We're going to talk about whatever that class used to look like. You lost them, first of all, the attention span, someone with all that going on inside of them, they're gone in the first 10 minutes. They're just checked out. They're you know, thinking anything other than that. And we have a lot of educational based programs. Fortunately, the, I don't see those the way they used to be in the 80s, early 90s. Some of them that weren't successful national programs, they rebranded them and included more of a treatment component and, and really built in the research. So I was glad to see them bring that in. We've had responses and reform that wanted to lock kids up for longer periods of time, which has been you know turned. They realized that wasn't effective. It actually they left much more criminal than they went in with. So we're learning about, as we've mentioned, both what works, but what consistently does not work. And so those shaming, scaring, educating, and exercising crime out of a person makes adults feel good. That's what they are. They're adult feel good program. I made these kids cry today. Look at me. <laughs> that's not my view, but you know, I think that's how they went home. Look at how I got tough on this person who's out of control. And it's all about the provider of it, that ego sense of what they're doing, and not at all about an understanding of what caused someone to be there in the first place, and what in a much more thoughtful, strong, and compassionate way would help them get out. It's just light years away from each other. It's like what we talk about with trauma-informed care, right? The switch from what's wrong with you to 
what happened to you? Yes. What makes me think about that with the treatment? Absolutely. Absolutely. Just a bit of a data soundbite on that, what happened to you. They looked at thousands of juvenile offenders. It was a Florida study and they went and they, they applied the ACEs study to them to see how their ACE scores compared to the general population. So in the general population, when you look at individuals who answered yes to four or more, I was exposed to four or more traumatic events as a youth, right? People answered yes to that. In the general population, there was about 12% of the general population said yes. Of juvenile offenders, it was 50. So their exposure to trauma is much, much, much higher than in, in the general population. For adults in the system, we know it goes up as high as 85, 98%. I mean, it's, it's huge. It's huge. You read my mind, Ari. That's exactly what I was going to ask you. And I think it speaks to that piece that we talked about, that in the adult system, right, we feel like well, the juvenile system failed. Everybody here was through the juvenile system. It speaks to that, that... Yes, those are the folks that tend to move on, but it doesn't mean the juvenile system failed. It is an indication that there's a lot of people in the juvenile system that got the treatment and support and accountability that they needed early so they didn't, for lack of a better word, graduate into the adult system. Exactly. Exactly. And nobody sees that. It's like I said, it's not the visible group or who you hear about, but there's so many, obviously, you get so many success stories about those individuals that that response make a difference for the rest of their life. And then for everyone in their life and how they're treated, it makes a difference for generations then. So can we turn the tides on it? Absolutely. I think the juvenile justice system has gone from having a chronic group of what I started when I started the research of 17% and what I see now is 10 to 4%. Wow. And they did that over the last 20 years. Very, very small. I also applied a cost modeling. So in addition to reducing crimes and uh, reducing the probability of someone being a victim of crime, there is a cost savings associated with that. And so I'm not going to try to verbally model it for you, but we, there's a cost per crime that's associated with cost for law enforcement, the courts, cost of victims, probation, juvenile justice system. And for every crime avoided, that's a cost avoided. And so we could talk about this in specific numbers. Yeah, a reduction of 65% for a cost savings for one community of uh, 1.7 million. And I'm just throwing that number out there, but those are the kinds of numbers I've seen in the cost modeling. Because that chronic group is so busy that if you positively influence even a small proportion of them, it yields significant difference. It yields so many fewer crimes in the community and it yields so much savings. Ari, I'm wondering, I know that we're known a lot for the work we do in the adult system. And not very many people know that the center is also involved in work with the juvenile system, particularly with you heading that up. And I'm wondering if you want to talk about that a little bit. Yeah, thank you. It has been fortunate given my background in juvenile justice and now I'm working with you all at the center. One of the things the center provides is, of course, sequential intercept mapping, which is a national model that allows the center to come in and help facilitate community conversations with stakeholders and law enforcement, dispatch, the jails, the courts, elected officials, behavioral health, the ER, on how to divert people with behavioral health issues from the correction system. And it's based on an adult model. So the originators of it at PRA, I actually approached them and asked if I could modify it for juvenile justice, which they said, yes, go ahead and give me free reign to take their, their national model and create a juvenile justice frame on it. And I actually sometimes adjunct professor at some schools on teaching a class on juvenile justice and behavioral health based on a juvenile justice model of SIMS. So in the adult uh, workshops, often juvenile justice representatives are there and we talk about, would you like this applied in your, in, in your world? And Lynn Schroeder, who is the director of the juvenile justice department in Washington County asked for that and we ran the model with them. And I also realized by doing that work, even more than the Sims, the community is ready for, as we talked about earlier, just understanding the system, just understanding how the juvenile justice system works, 
the philosophy it's based on, the research behind it, and its efficacy and how it holds itself accountable. Lynn and her team in Washington County work very closely in collaboration with community members on implementing all of that and, and doing that work. So they have a great model of that. And still they ask for more enhancements with behavioral health as every juvenile department is starting to talk about. So Washington County is not unique there. They just helped with us putting together a presentation on the system. So the educational piece and the understanding of it, and then the foundational work for why this link, why this collaboration with behavioral health is so important. So the presentation includes um, background on the evolution of juvenile justice, its current philosophy, data on where youth are in the system for a county, the efficacy there, how many of youth reoffend based on where they are in the system, uh, looking at the risk assessment tool, how many youth have yeses on their ACEs related questions. And for those youth, can they start to do more care management, case management between juvenile justice and behavioral health? So Susan Gregory with Malheur County heard about it and asked for a version. And Lynn said, just, you know, take ours and, and apply it and modify it, what works for her. And so we did that and we presented to a group who work on the wraparound program with youth. And uh, they found the information very, very valuable and helpful. I'm meeting with other representatives right now in Eastern Oregon to talk about would they like to take this model and add uh, data and information relative to each one of their juvenile departments. Again, as I do with all of our work at Gobi and the research I've been involved in in juvenile justice, I'm not coming in with, I have an answer and you need to use this. It's, you know, this model has worked. What's going on in your community? Do you see this a benefit? And how could we modify it to help you meet your goals? And what are your local goals in the juvenile justice system? I just am there to be a steward of their work and I have an understanding of the research part of it and how to apply the data to help them tell their local story. And it's a wonderful collaboration. So I get to come back home in some ways, but come back a little bit broader resources being part of Gobi and the link around behavioral health, the link with the wraparound program. And of course, that combining with juvenile justice just takes us on yet another, another chapter of all of this in helping young people and their lives and their community and the systems that serve them. I'm so glad that we got a chance to talk about that because we don't get a chance to talk about that work very often. So thank you for sharing that with us today. The other thing, and if this is a good pivot point to another topic, which I think is, is pretty germane to our times and will come up as well, you know, we also know there's a problem in the juvenile justice system with overrepresentation of ethnic minority youth. And what about your tool with that? I get quest I get asked that a lot. And given my history with work and what, who's helped me along the way and what I've learned from and where I grew up, um, that's a huge concern of mine too. What I couldn't answer in that are two things. Well, a big point here is that in one answer, all of the information I just shared, the risk assessment tool, the risk to reoffend, applies to full groups. It applies by gender. It applies by race, ethnicity. It applies by age group. It's equally successful with all those groups. So um, being able to look at look at risk level and the types of influences and responding with treatment are equally applied with all groups. What is hard to respond to is saying the juvenile justice system application of things, of their responses, does not help a certain subgroup of youth, right? It's, or let me be more specific. What's harder to answer to is the system is over, there's overrepresentation in the juvenile justice system. And so that's a complete systems problem. And we have to revamp the whole system. I've just spent an hour and 15 minutes talking about how successful it is with all kids. It's not unsuccessful. And it is also successful with, um, based on gender and race ethnicity. What we had to do was design some research to show where it failed based on race. And actually I've set up that modeling and those research studies. 
So instead of my looking at, well, okay, there's overrepresentation in the juvenile justice system. That's absolutely true. That's not okay. We need to do this differently. People in the system want to do it differently. They go to all of these trainings and summits and workshops to try to, to try to figure out what's going on. And what I did was I said, well, look at a parity study. Overrepresentation is influenced by uh, census data. And so if you have bad census data, you won't even know the full extent of your problem. So do a parity study. For all youth who are referred to the system, put it on even playing field and say, are they equally treated the same? Do they stay in diversion programs equally? Or does some subgroup stay there longer and other subgroups are seen as a bigger threat, like ethnic minority populations is what we're talking about here. So they go to probation quicker. Does that happen? And if so, who's doing that in the system? Is it all the counselors? Is it a subset of them? Let's use the data to dissect where this is happening and respond to that juncture. Because it's very different when you look at those studies. Then you begin to see where things are working and where they're not. Are youth who leave a program, does their crime go down at the same rate? Or is it less successful for boys than girls? Is it less successful for youth from an Asian background compared to a white background or a Hispanic, Latino? background than what you can do that you can look at the data we say very fixed on the overrepresentation numbers i think they're important i don't want to dilute that but to me they're a red flag i wouldn't know how to change that it's like how do you throw a pebble in the lake and figure out which ripple is making the difference set up your data so you can find where it's not working and respond to it in that juncture and we have the parity studies to do that we have the recidivism data to do that. We have um, all of the research that would help pinpoint, okay, overrepresentation is happening, the response from the system, can you show where there's disparity? And then tell me your response to that once you find it. That's where we hold each other accountable. So can you give some examples of some research studies around this and what they've found where the gaps were? Are there any trends? I don't know about trends because my studies on it were episodic based on where I was working. So in a community, I ran the numbers and this is the kinds of things I found. I'll start with gender. So you have programs to help youth be held accountable to their victim by paying restitution to them, right? And I found that a higher rate of boys were sent to pay restitution than girls. And I thought, well, this is interesting. There's about, of all the juvenile offenders who are eligible, right, all else being equal, but who are eligible to pay back their victims, 95% in the group are boys and 5% of the girls. And the split in the system was different. So you'd expect to see that. So I did some research, and I'll, I'll never name the county that I was working in, of course, but I did some research and I talked to the work crew leader and I said, you know what? You have a lot of guys here. And so we were talking about it and he said, well, you know, girls could get pregnant if they were on the crew. Or girls have some monthly problems that would prevent them from being on the crew. Huh. So that both quantitative, where I was able to show the numbers, and then hearing from the individual their views and not taking those referrals, led me to go back to their supervisor, 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 and say, the problem here isn't the girls not paying back their victims. It's you have someone working there who doesn't allow girls in and has very archaic views on them uh, and some other issues that are completely problematic given the role they have. So what was the answer to that? A change in personnel. We don't like to talk about that. You know, we just say, oh, it's just everyone's great in the system. I will say, Chris, I've run into some amazing people who have done these amazing things and I couldn't be prouder to know them and what I've learned from them, from law enforcement, uh, who want to help young people and their families, to probation workers, to judges who spend hours figuring out how to do this differently and apply the research. The majority of people are good people who are doing really fantastic things. And then every once in a while, you run across a person I just described. And the appropriate response happened to the person, the people who are great and doing wonderful things, we need to cultivate that. And the people who aren't, it's okay to say goodbye to them. They should not be in that position. Another study I did was looking at the rate at which youth progressed to um, secure confinement. Was that equal among different race ethnicities? So I'm breaking it down. Oh, two studies. Let me talk about two studies with race ethnicity. 
youth who are in the uh, detention facility, so that it can reach cap because they only have so many beds. And when a new youth comes in that's higher risk or has to be detained, uh, they used to let youth out. They still do that, you know, they still do that. And they do that in the jails. It's called the matrix, early release to let in a higher risk. So one question I asked was, do they let uh, the white kids out more often than the youth of color? Just start with that basic of a question. And if so, who's making those decisions on what shifts? I didn't see that happen as much. Where it did happen, it seemed like I couldn't find a theme in it to say it was a pattern, but it did make people pay closer attention to it because they knew we reviewed the data regularly. The other piece was the question of were they were youth, ethnic minority, uh, youth of color going to uh, secure lockup quicker based on the same kind of crimes and the same kind of risk factors. So in that study, I pulled samples of cohorts of youth and I looked at what crime they had committed, what their risk score was, and what number of crime was it their first, second, or 50th. And I put alike kids together and then track them for um, the response from the system. And in Oregon, in some smaller communities, it was a hard study because in smaller communities, in some instances, if one youth was committed, they were overrepresented, right? So you couldn't not have part of it. So then I looked at, well, the crimes they were committing to go, did that make sense? And it did. The one thing I saw in the commitment data was fewer youth who were mono speaking Spanish youth, or primarily Spanish was their primary language, were not going to treatment as often as secure confinement. And so when I, and I would bring the providers together, this wasn't something I was doing to them and running to, you know, let's, I bring the providers together and say, here's the data, let's look at what's happening. Uh, we published it, it was not hidden anywhere. I'm a very transparent researcher. If you don't want people to see what's going on, do not ask me to look at your data because I am not about cloak behind the scenes secrets with anything in life. It's about, you're asking me to do it because you want to make a change on things that aren't working. And I will share that. So as we should, you know, it's public information. So when we brought everyone together, they simply said, we didn't have staff in the facilities who spoke Spanish. It wasn't a viable resource. And so then we started to move the winds of change of diversifying staff, diversifying curriculum is what they did with that information, a different recruitment for staff, different incentives. So ideally, a placement that had resources for youth based solely on their language would be ideal, but unless you're in individualized treatment foster care, that's probably not going to happen. But they did take the information and work to diversify their staff and have culturally competent and uh, linguistically appropriate individuals. So I was asked to do parity studies by people who wanted to make real change, and they were willing to let people go. They were willing to, when needed, they were willing to train people where needed, and they were willing to, to look at how to improve the workforce and the approach when needed. Because the juvenile offender should not get a more severe response because the treatment response wasn't culturally competent. So that's where disparity happens. That's where it's not disproportionate numbers, it's different treatment based on who you are. And of course, getting into the system opens up that whole door. Do more affluent families have different resources to get into treatment? Probably yess. Yeah, probably. I'd, I'd lie if I say that wasn't part of our society. But are we looking at the equity, parity, fairness, treatment first, corrections to be appropriate and not be a, a lifelong anchor for an individual? I think the juvenile justice system has done a lot of reform on that over the years. And is there room for improvement? Incredibly so. And where will we find the wisdom to do that? Partially in the research and partially from the youth and families who are involved. They'll tell us how to improve it. It's just like working with those kids at the youth center. It was like working with in behavioral health and listening to people with lived experiences. It's like going to the jails and interviewing people who are in there or the prisons and talking about trauma-informed care. And you listen, you listen, you listen. If we're going to reform the system more. It needs to involve the people who are negatively affected by it. We shouldn't be afraid of them. We should be students of them. I want to go back to your three stories, and I think they highlight the importance of data collection and studies to get at the root of issues. If folks had never looked at the data and never asked the questions, they wouldn't have known about 
any of those situations. And all those situations were, I don't want to say easy to remedy, but had a remedy. And so I guess it highlights for me your your famous saying with us, which is data rocks, and <laughs> that it's really important. Uh, some folks, I think, get a little intimidated and scared of looking at the data around these questions. And I think it really highlights how important it is to look at it because there may be answers that as intimidating and overwhelming as sometimes all of this seems, by going in and looking at the data and starting to ask questions, sometimes we can make small changes that are incredibly impactful to the system because we ask the right questions in a data-driven manner. As you know, I'm a huge fan of data, so I have to plug why we should look at data. Well, it's, it's just such a great summary. I, I believe that, and I think uh, nature is a good teacher in that too, that small gestures can lead to grand movements. It's not always about you're in a really a completely dark room and you need a room of equal size of light in order to see. You just need a match, you know, you need a match. And I believe there are a lot of people, I know there are a lot of people in the system who are torchbearers and want to make a difference. And the data helps identify where. And it can be intimidating and overwhelming. And so what happens then is a system gets to experience what individuals in it feel, especially individuals who might not be treated as fairly. They feel intimidated. They completely have no power. They do feel completely overwhelmed. They are being triggered for everything that they've ever felt would, would go wrong in their lives is. And so I think if the system can't figure out its way through that by asking hard questions and being uncomfortable and bringing in data and bringing up people with lived experiences to bring in qualitative data and synthesizing that into real change, then how can they expect a young person coming into their system to take a risk to change their lives if the system isn't willing to model it? And that's where I think that's stuck, Chris. That's stuck. And that perpetuates what doesn't work. It's something we don't tolerate with people who are referred to our system, but we tolerate it with the professionals leading it. And we don't, we shouldn't. That there's just the majority of us in this world, the majority of us who have these kinds of backgrounds of understanding and curiosity and intellect and care that really want to make a difference. We just have to be really loud because we're getting drowned out by the people who like that individual on the work crew just need to go. So if someone was interested and wanted to find out more, I recently found out that you were a published author. And so mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you want to talk about that a little bit. No, that's nice of you to ask. I'm very proud of it. You know, I love writing. And when I was working for Lane County, I collaborated with uh, Lisa Smith and John Aaron's. Lisa was the director of the juvenile department at the time. She replaced Steve Carmichael, and she was approached by Penguin Publishing to write a book about what works, but they wanted something different. They didn't want a real Ivy League, all the research and things that we can spew out forever. They wanted this to be really accessible to people. And what they did was they asked us to use real life stories to frame what works. So we interviewed youth who were either currently in the system, who had gone through and were successfully out, who had gone through and were in prison for life for the crimes they committed. We interviewed um, probation workers and other professionals and would and then use their story. So you get the summary of their lives and what happened. And then it's framed within what would have helped based on risk need about treatment and all those other things, but it's brought in in a very personal level of these individual lives. So the name of the book is Dispatches from Juvenile Hall, Fixing a Failing System. I wrote that under my legal name, I'm Linda Wagner. I changed it to Ari as part of the witness protection plan. I'm kidding, of course. <laughs> but you just failed in witness protection plan, Ari. <laughs> the first rule of witness protection is not to announce it on a podcast. I changed yeah. it about 12 years ago to Ari instead of Linda. So, um, But it was written under my legal name, Linda Wagner. And it was just such a, Chris, to say the word honor, talk about a humbling experience, really, because John and Lisa would interview individuals, and then I would listen to the tape and work on the writing and then we'd meet as a group and rewrite 
and sitting and listening to their stories. First of all, I had to turn it off sometimes because I was so emotionally overcome with what I was hearing. And I wasn't new to this, to the, as a professional, I, you know, you heard my, my history there, but just to, as it happened when I'd go to juvenile court, and sometimes you'd go sit in the back of the court and you'd see the youth there and you'd see the DA and you'd see all these people, but no family up at the table with them. Not a parent, not a, not a relative. They're sitting there alone. And, and you just had this, if you don't have an emotional reaction to that, there is something disconnected inside, I think. So to see just what impacts people's lives in the harshness of life and trying to find yourself in it is very, it's, it's an emotional experience. So as I listened to those tapes and I heard about the nine-year-old who was out playing at the park with her friend and someone at the park gave them meth and that was her first time on meth and they stayed up all night and they felt good and they talked and and that was her introduction into years and years of substance abuse when i listened to experiences in the foster care system and this by no means is a hammer on all foster families i think they're very dedicated wonderful it's a lot of success there but as it happened the interviewees who came to us by random selection in the book had histories in that system where they were abused, where they were over-medicated, where they were sexually abused. And, and that was a segue into the juvenile justice world. And you, when you listen to those and you just think, you know, at any given time, had there been a healthy adult to intervene and do something, I wouldn't be hearing I wouldn't be hearing this. And more importantly, this individual's life would not have experienced some horrific things that adults couldn't know how to manage. It's just so this teeter of all of our best parts that could make so much difference that I've seen over and over. I believe in, I, I have that empirical and emotional and hope all tied together, but it didn't line up for them. You know, they were exposed to people who wanted to exploit them, to harm them to change the path of their young lives into something that for some of these young people in the book ended up being a lifelong sentence. So at any given time, we get to choose. So I said to my daughter the whole time she was growing up, any given time you get to choose. You're part of the harm or you're part of the healing. And I think because of the harm that's done to so many, they continue to act it out on others. And we just have to accelerate the healing to catch up on the momentum of what's been devastating for people. When you talked about the one adult, that's borne out in the research that that's a protective factor, that even if someone has a lot of risk factors as a child, that one adult can make such a huge difference. And I was also thinking about your stories about the foster care system. Well, the horrific stories would be the stories that we would hear with individuals who ended up penetrating farther into the system. It wouldn't be the foster care stories where it was an adult that was supportive and helpful and, and healing. It would be more likely to be the horrific stories. And unfortunately, those are the very difficult stories that we hear of what people have experienced and really difficult for us to hear for the people who are working within the system and the vicarious trauma that goes along with, with hearing all of those stories. It's very, very true when you bring up the resiliency that can make a difference. So let's look at what does make a difference and what could help before you ever get there, right? Positive adult in your life, whether that be at sports, in some class, your art instructor, your teacher, your auntie, your parent, your grandma, whoever that person is, can make the world a difference. And there are examples of that in the book for sure. They, People made it out of the system talk about that counselor who just hung in there regardless, the probation counselor who was their, their resiliency person or the judge that was their resiliency person. Um, there's um, things you can do to help. You know, I never use the word, even though we talked about who's high risk, I don't like that term because I don't think anyone's born high risk, right? There's, in, there's vulnerable individuals in high risk environments. So I'll give you an example of resiliency around school and making a difference there. Um, the Juvenile Justice Center in, in the county where I worked had an empty pod. There were three pods of, in the detention facility. One was empty. So they decided to retrofit it as a school for youth who had been suspended from traditional school. So these are youth who were kicked out of regular school, teenagers kicked out of regular school. 
they turned a detention pod into a classroom. So they retrofitted it so youth could enter it without going through the secure part. They put things up on the wall so it didn't look institutionalized, covered doors, brought in cool things, brought in teachers so that the teacher and the PO back there. And youth took a bus. We got the bus system to bring them to this school. So it was accredited that, you know, we had the working with this was after the campus was built. So you have the nonprofits involved in providing treatment, education, kids are getting their GED. Of those youth referred to the program, and these are kids who were kicked out because of their negative behavior in the regular schools, right? 98% went there, voluntarily showed up to a look like a detention serving as a classroom, voluntarily, the court, they went there, and the teachers combined it with the kitchen at the detention facility. So they had culinary arts to learn about math, how to measure, how, they had culinary arts, they were taught how to cook. Um, they catered certain events and the youth would get up and talk about the food they make and what they did. And they were very proud of what, what resiliency am I getting to in this longer story? Success. Because in school, they had multiple failures. No one knew how to figure out how to intervene in their acting out. So all they had was failure, failure, failure. So if you have a low sense of yourself, that's going to prove it, right? You know, fail classes, can't do it, can't, uh, can't, can't fill in the blank. The alternative school at the retrofitted detention facility was set up for success. Everything was meeting youth where they're at and helping them learn to go to the next step in a supportive environment, including the kitchen. There were other things that they did. So graduation day, because I had, we had a formal graduation gowns, everything. We had speakers. Um, for the kids, I walked into the room to see how it was, where graduation was going to be, and there was this gentleman sitting up front, and he had a baseball cap on, and his his arms were were crossed, and he was looking down, and I thought, oh, okay, what's going on here? So I walked over and I said, sir, can I help you? You know, graduation isn't for several hours. He said, I know, my son is graduating today. I said, oh, well, congratulations. And then I thought, you know, well, can I get you something? Did you want to wait here this whole time? And he said, I want to make sure I have a good seat because I didn't think this day would ever happen. Oh, I love that story. Still chokes me up. Somebody believed in him, even after he got kicked out of high school. A whole classroom was set up to believe in him, to make him have a success he hadn't had before. And his family got to celebrate that. I think that is a wonderful story to end on. But before we end, I'm wondering, Ari, if you have some final thoughts for our listeners. Well, I appreciate what you're doing here, Chris. You know, it's it's getting information out of, about the intercept between corrections and today juvenile corrections and behavioral health and what makes a difference and what matters when we come together and be smart on what we need to do and work as a high functioning system along with including the people we're trying to serve as part of the solution, not part of the problem. And sharing that in this venue just gives more ears access to it. So I just, as I've said to you one-on-one, -on -one, really applaud you having this idea and then the inspiration and innovation to see it through. So I guess I'd say in the closing thoughts, what I hope I've echoed through my talk with you today that there's more reason for hope than to be worried about young people, that there's a very educated, high functioning system in place with caring people that are willing to take a look at what's not working and try to make a difference. And that the young people who are there are often there by circumstances outside of their immediate means on how to cope. It doesn't mean we shouldn't hold them accountable because we need to. Some harm was done and, and that should be held accountable. And in some cases, higher ends of the correction system need to be applied, but it needs to be applied in a way that helps them with treatment, with addressing risk, be their better selves, the person they came into this world to be and try to connect with that. So they can, as we say, be contributing members of society, which is, you know, an old way of saying you got to live your best self. That's a cool day at work. Well, I think that you have demonstrated that well during our conversation today. And I just thank you, Ari and Karen and Gobi, for supporting us in this project. I think like we were talking about earlier, it's about being in the right place at the right time with the right support and the right mentors. And 
we definitely appreciate the opportunity to be able to help spread the word on partnerships and projects that work in Oregon. I mean, what an honor. In this project, I get to sit down and chat with people that I highly respect and talk about what great work they're doing and send that out for Oregon to listen to. It doesn't get any better than that. So I really appreciate the support you all have for this podcast because it's been enlightening, but also just a really fun project. That's great work. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Thank you, Ari. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Chris. The Center Collaborative is a production of the Oregon Center on Behavioral Health and Justice Integration, a specialized division of Greater Oregon Behavioral Health Incorporated. It is produced by me, Chris Thomas, with production assistance from Patrick Kennedy. Music by Patrick Mulvihill and Patrick Kennedy. Subscribe to the Center Perspective using your favorite app. To learn more about criminal justice and behavioral health in Oregon, visit the Center's website at ocphji.org. You can also find us on Facebook. We'd love to hear from you. Please reach out to us. Join us next time as we chat with the experts about programs and partnerships at work within this complex and yet compelling field.